Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Crypto Café. My name is Fubrokers. I'm uh, here with uh, Malman, uh, Rickles and Kiko. Um, say hello everyone. Yellow. Hello, hello. Hello everyone. Hello. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, today we have a very special guest. Um, Mike, uh, uh, thank you uh, for joining Crypto Café tonight. Um, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yes, thanks. Thanks a lot for that. And thanks for having me on. Um, I'm very excited to be here. So my name is Mike Mendez, also Portuguese, by the way, learning Portuguese. I've got a long way to go. Um, oh, yeah, for sure. But, uh, <laughs> we, we, can, we can start here. We can make it in Portuguese as usual. No, no, no. I think uh, I think I'd struggle. But um, yeah, just, just Mike Mendez work at, at Ivy Labs. It's a, a non, uh, non-profit uh, trust, pur- a purpose trust company. And we're one of the core contributors uh, for RSK, the RSK blockchain. Um, I can maybe get into it. I'm not too sure how we, how we typically run it here. Maybe there's a more question answers kind of open to discussion or how would we, how would we like oh, to? How do, how do you start on crypto? How do you join the crypto world? Yeah, 2017, like when, I, steps in the crypto when I bought right at the top. I bought right at the top and I sold right at the bottom. I was, I'm not the best trader in the world. I wouldn't <laughs> give anyone financial advice. Um, but yeah, I, I started actually around pre-2017, but got more involved during that amazing crash. Awesome. Um, and I said, if it ever recovered, that this is where the future would be. And uh, as soon as there was some sort of recovery, <laughs> went full time more into the, into the DeFi um, uh, um, components of, of crypto. And yeah, I have not looked back. To, it's, I haven't looked back since, you know, come crash, come whatever needs to come for into the future. I think we can all agree fed in a bear market at the moment. But um, uh, yeah, definitely seeing this in the future. Not selling. Not <laughs> selling. <laughs> no, no, I mean, selling. No, 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 no. There's, uh, there's, uh, there's always um, a time and place for everything, of course. But I think having a diversified portfolio is probably the right answer. <laughs> 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 probably not not the best not the best decision to do during bear markets but i like your approach i have the same approach about hodling i don't give a shit it's honey badger style right and you too i mean you're doing rsk so that means you have the honey badger like you know blood within you approach. right inside you so um yeah you just buy and hold and you don't give a shit about the price i mean i like that approach um yeah go on go on sorry about that yeah no all good and that's how i started getting into crypto <laughs> have always been aligned. I think as most of us were started in Bitcoin, um, I think it sure. was, uh, if you've been in the, in the industry for quite a while, Bitcoin was the beginning. And then we evolved into understanding Ethereum and all the DeFi components that came with it. Um, and love the vision that RSK has as in terms of what it is being a Bitcoin sidechain, So aligned with the Bitcoin ethos, but being EVM compatible, which means you can build smart contract capability as you do on Ethereum. So we can actually build DeFi on top of Bitcoin is the whole, the whole theme and messaging. Um, and got, I was quite attracted to, to, to that whole, um, let's say, vision in terms of where the future is going. And yeah, I wanted to be more involved on the client side, love dealing, you know, speaking, love dealing with partners. Um, and yeah, now heading up the accounts at, at Ivy Labs with all the partners building on RSK, which I'm sure I'll touch on it during, um, during the podcast. I'm, I'm yeah, curious so, about, uh, sorry, Hickles, yeah, go on, go on. Go, yeah, go, go, I was go, basically go. just going to ask uh, if you could uh, give us a bit of an introduction into IOV Labs and uh, uh, the connection to RSK uh, and Rootstock. Sure. It originally was, um, uh, let's say, the founder of, of, of the RSK chain. There's a gentleman by the name of Sergio Luna. Yeah. Highly recommend anyone that's in, in Bitcoin uh, who's followed that, that journey quite closely. He was the ultimate designer of the, the RSK chain. So Ivy Lab started as a different, uh, a different entity, which evolved into what is Ivy Labs today. And that's a core contributor towards both the RSK chain, as well as to the builders on top of RSK. That could be the uh, projects more DeFi related or infrastructure projects. Um, so Ivy is supporting this growth on top of RSK. And um, that can be with the Web3 companies, but there's also been a lot of interest with the traditional Web2 companies that are looking to evolve their services on top of a blockchain. Uh, and that's how we get more involved. So we partner up with, with the, the various uh, projects, we help them along their way, 
and we're more uh, cross-composable with all the projects. So if a sovereign, which I'll get into them shortly as well, that's our biggest uh, protocol that's built on, on top RSK. of our escape, we then cross-composable with all other, other projects. Um, and the, 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 let's say the overall value is we don't see RSK as being um, uh, not aligned with, like we, I, I definitely believe there's um, a, a market for other blockchains as well. The, the actual vision of RSK is a joint between Bitcoin as well as Ethereum. So there's a lot of flexibility in terms of how we see uh, projects building on top of RSK and where that actually leads for the future. Um, so that's the, the, let's say, the, the value proposition of where Ivy Labs comes in. And then, of course, RSK being the open source uh, Bitcoin sidechain, which I'm happy to get into as well in terms of what that means for technology as a sidechain. And I think there's a lot of confusion around what a sidechain is and isn't. Um, so happy to also uh, touch on those points. You, you sure. can ex explain to us what is a sidechain then on the sure. Bitcoin network? Sure. No. So a sidechain, um, there's a couple of different uh, terminologies, but essentially it's a layer two. But the sidechain itself is got the parent chain, which is Bitcoin, and the sidechain, which is just another parallel blockchain. The important feature here is that what it links to it is uh, RSK does not have a um, a speculative token underneath it. So, uh, for example, Ethereum has ETH uh, or Avalanche has AVAX. RSK is something called RBTC. So it's very aligned with Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, we're actually bringing more utility onto the bit, onto Bitcoin because you can actually use Bitcoin in our smart contract um, uh, chain. It works like uh, WBTC, right? For example. Similar. It's, it's Similar. a different mechanism. Um, in, in our instance, it's a federated peg. So it is a federation okay. behind the scenes that then brings the, let's say, um, supports the uh, BTC moving over into RBTC. Sure. Um, the goal in the future is to decentralize that component of our escape. Um, but there's a peg, right? I mean, there's a peg between RBTC and BTC. That's the point, 100%, right? 100%. Okay. So it's a one-to-one -one peg. So the, yeah. um, again, you're more aligning to Bitcoin. Lock. Yeah, you lock funds. Yeah. 100%. Um, so yeah, that's the uh, the let's say the overall value proposition with that we're bringing is more the EVM compatibility to build up the smart contracts and financial services on on RSK, uh, which brings obviously flexibility to what Bitcoin can or can't do because at the moment, um, Bitcoin doesn't have that capability to really scale out the services and that's where RSK fits in. And there's a lot of other good work from other side chains like Liquid. Lightning is doing some amazing work. Um, overall, the 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 overall value in terms of what's happening with Bitcoin is outstanding. Like if you're looking at what's happening in El Salvador uh, and other uh, Latam countries, there's a huge amount of innovation that's happening, maybe not on top of Bitcoin itself, but on top of these side chains and kind of payment layers, which is really taking um, Bitcoin to the next stage of this, this growth of, of, of what we need to see to um, um, mess up. Uh, like the people just to just all the and do you people. do you in, sorry to interrupt but do, sure. do you in, integrate with with lightning for instance for payments or do you have your own solution there is a bridge with lightning right. um that's been developed by sovereign so the, the again here it's more about being cross composable i think there's not one single blockchain that will win there's going to be multiple mm -hmm. chains that will have different niches mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and our goal is to be as cross composable with the networks as possible. So we do have a bridge with, with Lightning that was built by the Sovereign team. So you mm -hmm. can actually bridge the RBTC with LBTC on Sovereign on, um, on Lightning and vice versa. And the goal is to then expand those kind of services and capabilities out um, because Lightning is very well adopted within El Salvador. Uh, and that's also a kind of space that we want to also be moving into for that cross um, uh, adoption. That's uh, pretty cool, actually, I think. Um, I mean, and uh, you, you said earlier, um, it's kind of like building in Ethereum because you have the EVM. Um, I mean, what, what, are, what are the differences then? I mean, can, can you build everything that you build in Ethereum or are there limitations yet? Absolutely. On, on essentially, it's um, a large part of the code is actually just from the Ethereum base. So being EVM sure. compatible, anyone that has uh, Solidity knowledge can build on top of RSCAP. Okay. And uh, all the dApps, of course, that have been built have uh, been built in Solidity. Um, there are differences, of course, between Ethereum that are more, let's say, technical in nature. Uh, for example, um, let's say more the, the pros and cons. If you look at RSK, it's much cheaper, but I think every chain or many chains can offer the same kind of outcome, right? I think everyone's cheaper than Ethereum at the moment. Sure. Uh, maybe not at the moment with, with, the, with the downturn in market and what's happening, but um, <laughs> let's say cheaper is not 
the value proposition that I think everyone should be targeting. It's yep. what, because everyone could be cheaper than Ethereum at, at some point in time when we look at a, a bull market again. Sure. Where we are more involved in is in terms of the, the Bitcoin, and that's our value proposition in saying financial services are adopting Bitcoin, like we've seen governments adopting Bitcoin. We know one, obviously, the more bigger one that everyone all knows, El Salvador. Um, and our value proposition is con if this continues, this growth is happening, then chains or side chains of Bitcoin will succeed because that adoption is happening, but that scale cannot be achieved on top of Bitcoin itself. It needs the um, uh, side chains for that that um, level of scalability. So could I build like a Uniswap for, you know, yes. on top of RSK? Oh, that's, is there a Uniswap on top of RSK? There is something called Sovereign. So Sovereign um, is an amazing, amazing application that's both a DEX with pairs all with RBTC. So their pairs on our, um, you know, you could have USDT with RBTC, but RBTC is the based pair across, across, um, across all the um, AMM tokens or AMM pairs. They've got lending and borrowing services. You could lend out Bitcoin and um, uh, USDT and something called XUSD, which I'll touch on as well. But they've got lending and borrowing services, margin trading services. We could use Bitcoin as that, uh, um, as the collateral. Um, I mean, they've kind of tried to build a full suite of financial services on top of RSK, which is essentially then on top of Bitcoin. So you are correct. I mean, there's always room for more. So if you're keen on building something on RSK, I'm not going to ever turn down that uh, <laughs> um, that that option. So um, but yeah, so Sovereign is the closest in terms of that uh, AMM okay. capability. Okay, that, that's pretty cool because I mean, there's there's a bunch of things and protocols that you can transpose from Ethereum, right? Um, so yeah, I I, I mean, I, like, are there many teams building like curves and Daves and stuff like that and NFTs and whatever? Yeah, at the moment on the NFT side, less um, less focused. There okay. is a, a couple of NFT platforms. There's one that's launched that's particularly focused on uh, Latin America called Carnival, Carnival Art. Okay. Um, they're focusing on the Ibero, um, Ibero, uh, Ibero, uh, Ibero American artists. So both okay. between Spain, Portugal, and uh, and Latam, and promoting those artists and their artwork within the platform. Um, that's been built on built on top of RSK. But overall, the activity of NFTs has been less um, less prominent than on some of the other chains. Uh, then, then on RSK, um, and then of course we've got uh, there's a quite a lot of other DeFi applications and like wallet services. So the in terms of the amount of um, partners that have built, I would probably say it's approaching between sixty and seventy. Uh, you've got the standard wallets like MetaMask, okay. like everyone will know that. I mean, given uh, RSK is EVM compatible, okay. you could use MetaMask to interact with it. Um, and yeah, just a ton so, of infrastructure. So, wait, so, so it's like. It's, you just said you just said the RPC and you go for you, you just go to it, right? Hundred percent. Yep. On the MetaMask. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I was saying that you just did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's that's freaking awesome, man. That's that's awesome. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> so, so in the same way, we connect with other chains like Avalanche. You can do it on BSC as well. RSK is just another one that you could add on top of. Um, um, you could connect via MetaMask, and there are some more um, awesome wallets. I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Liquidity before. Um, I'm a big fan of the services. They definitely want to look out for. I mean, they don't just build on top of RSK. They're building across across chains. Um, but they offer atomic swaps so that you could swap between Bitcoin into ETH or ETH into RBTC, um, all from within the wallet. So not just swapping on this on the same uh, um, network. You could swap between different networks. Very very interesting application. They're very um, uh, integrated on top of RSK as well. Highly recommend to, to look into them. Non-custodial, similar to the MetaMask approach with the browser extension. Yeah, anyway, sorry. Sorry for the sidetrack. What was no, the no, name no, of that? that? Uh, Liquality. I can, uh, I can type it up. Yeah, type it in, in our chat. Uh, I have never heard of that. Liquality. It seems like uh, something Kiku would enjoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Also consensus-led. Um, consensus so there's uh, um, some really good people that are building out that wallet. It's been around for a while as well. But as we know, there's so many wallets and providers and partners, and just if you're not yeah. up to date every single day with everything up. new, <laughs> you impossible. Can't keep up. Speaking of consensus, how does work uh, RSK consensus of the blockchain? The RSK blockchain consensus is based on the um, something called merge mining. So, okay. in other words, with, we've with got Bitcoin? with Bitcoin. Yeah. So the Bitcoin oh, miners yes. are actually at the heart of of RSK. So. 
The same miners that are that's securing the network on Bitcoin, they are doing something called merge mining on top of RSK. So uh, there's a couple of benefits to this. Like one is we're leveraging, instead of creating a new chain which has its own um, energy consumption, like we're actually just leveraging what Bitcoin does, uh, all the Bitcoin miners are doing, and that's being leveraged across onto RSK. So they're securing, um, securing the network. Um, and of course, that's that also just gives a, a fair amount of decentralization because we're seeing the proof of work and a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies moving away from it. Of course, one of the big ones, Ethereum. Um, and we believe that we'll see a lot of cryptos or a lot of uh, chains doing that, moving more towards the proof of stake. Where RSK, I think, has a bit of a niche is because we just leverage on top of Bitcoin. I mean, we're not actually compounding any um, energy concerns. We're just leveraging what Bitcoin has, and that's being used on top of RSK. So um, you almost have a, a benefit of now the same, the same energy consumption, the same miners are just now securing RSK. And the you hash know, rate... The, the, the percentage of uh, miners uh, on RSK? Yes, it's, that's, uh, that ranges between 50 and 70%. So that just... Um, okay. Uh, that, that number does vary depending on the month. I can get. You mean most... uh, fifty to seventy percent of the, the hash. regular Bitcoin miners? Yes, of uh, of the miners. So that would be um, across board. So I've got there's an updated stats. I'm happy to share it uh, as well. I'll just get the latest uh, the latest numbers. But that number does range between fifty and seventy yes. percent, which is All which right. is awesome. It just means that. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. That's, that's a great number. <laughs> We're trying to get that all the way to 100, but uh, there's there's always challenges with that, of course. <laughs> what, what does um, a miner get in reward for merge mining uh, RSK? Since you use Bitcoin, Bitcoin. As they get Bitcoin. Currently? They get Bitcoin. So basically, the the um, transactions which occur on, on RSK, they um, I don't know if the word's entitled, but they will be receiving a percentage of that. Yep. So they okay. earn. On the Bitcoin side, and also earn on on the RSK side, you know, from all that activity. Well, th there is no base uh, reward on RSK, just the fees. That's it. So uh, okay. a very aligned. Uh, so if we had um, a speculative token, I think it would be different. But given we fully aligned with um, the parent chain being Bitcoin, anything that the miners are doing on top of our, on top of Bitcoin, they're receiving also on top of RSK. So as yes, RSK yes. scales and grows. The miners are actually more incentivized to continue on top of Bitcoin. You know, so we actually see, we actually what what happens in is that we're incentivizing miners to continue with with Bitcoin as well. Which ideally, if RSK continues to expand, that benefits the miners and the security on top of Bitcoin. So there's a uh, it's a, a a mutual benefit relationship between RSK and Bitcoin in that Symbiotic. sense for the miners. Yeah, a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic yeah. relationship. <laughs> So, but maybe uh, I would just ask the opposite, which is uh, since uh, RSK is a, is a sidechain and uh, since there's no native, let's just say no native blockchain or token uh, by itself, um, what, uh, what are the normal criticisms of, uh, of RSK in terms of, uh, let's say, the, how the project was uh, designed in terms of architecture, uh, is there something uh, that is, uh, I mean, that is relevant uh, that uh, we should be aware of, or uh, because basically I would guess it's mostly about the federation, not 100%. much else. Yep, uh, I would. I think that's a fair comment. I mean, the um, federated peg is is more centralized in that sense. Um, yeah. The goal is that. Uh, we've actually got a, a, a BIP that's um, available. I can also share it as well. I think it's uh, BIP R11, if I'm not mistaken. And that's to make uh, Bitcoin adopt the drive chain, which allows the, the actual miners to be responsible for the peg as well. So instead of being a federated peg with, uh, uh, with entities and users, um, that then becomes a the miners are also securing the peg as well. So we're okay. approaching that. That's quite a big, big, um, a big uh, initiative of ours. Uh, but at the moment, we don't. This is the best model that we have for uh, for the current time. So until that gets adopted by the Bitcoin Core team, that's definitely something that we want or we've we've proposed. I think that proposal has been out since 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah, drive chains for... have been around for a long time, but they seem to be stuck on some uh, <laughs> on some issues uh, or disagreements between the core development team. Yeah, I think I think technically I wouldn't be able to comment in terms of like why, but yeah. Uh, also, I mean, there's, 
I think there's pros and cons also for what Bitcoin is, because Bitcoin is secure and it is uh, almost, let's say, fairly tamper-proof because it doesn't get updated daily or doesn't get updated monthly or weekly or yearly. Um, that also brings a lot of security. Like anyone that's worked in tech um, and if you up update or upgrade things quite often, inevitably, as much as you can QA test, things break. So um, Bitcoin has that, I, I think, quite better down. It's like it's that level of security. Um, we can talk about the innovation, but that's where I think the layer twos and the side chains are more responsible. Like he's bringing that innovation, um, keeping Bitcoin as the, um, as the main chain and then building on top of the likes of RSK or Liquid or, or Lightning. I think that's where the innovation occurs. And ideally would like to see um, Bitcoin adopt that um, the, the, and the core development team, but uh, completely understanding why it just takes time to get those, those things pushed through. Um, yeah, and I really like that approach also of uh, just having a good base layer and uh, trying to build all of the other protocols uh, on top of it. That makes total sense. 100%. Yeah, and leveraging the, the hash rate as well. I think it's smart. You get yeah. the benefit of the security, but as you were saying, you're not double spending the energy. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I'm happy to share there's um, a fairly detailed... Uh, blog um, blog post by uh, Sergio Luna. I'm very happy to share that as well with uh, yourself and the, the rest of the communities. I think it's very, very valuable. Um, the the kind of level of detail that's gone into it and the thinking, um, I don't think I could express it as well is, as what's is been Sergio doing. still uh, the lead uh, maintainer or developer of RSK? He's one of the um, uh, contributors. So he's and definitely... Um, uh, in in the conversations around the you know the RSK as a chain, uh, as, yeah, as I, I still remember his name from when RSK was uh, being proposed. Amazing. Uh, several years ago, so <laughs> that's, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, he's around. I've got a good relationship with him. He's uh, an awesome an awesome guy. So, what is IOV Labs uh, doing? Uh, I I know you have some projects at least. Uh, in uh, Latin America and stuff. Could you talk to us a little bit more about that? Yes, there's, there's been a big um, LATAM focused, mainly mm -hmm. because uh, many of the founders were based in Argentina. Exactly. That was yeah. uh, probably the reason why there's been a lot more, um, uh, let's say, development and a lot more activity coming out of, uh, of LATAM. Um, but we are seeing a, a lot of global exposure. For example, a lot of the sovereign team is based out of, sorry, my, my cat's running around here. Uh, a lot of the sovereign team is based out of um, out of the UK, and I think currently also moving between. Uh, sorry, just give me one one second. The, the cat's getting a bit out of hand. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, man. We love cats. Sorry, I've uh, I lost I lost my chain of thought. This it was around uh, Latin America. So there's and even though because uh, RSK is completely open source, you can build it from anywhere. Um, but because the founders were largely based there, we saw a lot of adoption coming out of Latam, in particular. Argentina, a lot of stuff happening out of Colombia as well. So I mentioned a bit about that NFT project being Carnival Art. That's very focused on the, um, the, the artists out of Portugal, Spain, as well as uh, Latam. But we're seeing some amazing projects like, I'll, I'll just talk through a couple that I think is you know, a different to what we're seeing in the market, because there's a lot of things that are very similar in there. Uh, like you'll have it on Ethereum, you'll have it on Avalanche, you'll have it on others. Um, one I really like is called Krypton, um, and I'll type it in the in the chat as well. It's called Krypton Market. And what's super interesting about Krypton that's a little bit different than I think a lot of projects is you could use your MetaMask or your non-custodial and you could purchase items. It's There's only six countries that they offer the, the service to, um, Argentina, Colombia, El Salvador, and a couple of others in uh, Latin America. But you could connect on their version of Amazon. I think it's uh, Mercado Libre. And you could purchase those goods using your non-custodial wallet. And they handle the, the actual delivery. So you want to buy a cup, a hat, anything like that, you could use your non-custodial. You could just use your MetaMask to make that purchase, uh, which I think is actually quite a, quite a cool offering for, um, really cool. for what it is. It handles swaps inside, the, inside as well. So you can swap between various chains. Um, and you can pay your uh, uh, bills. So, for example, you want to pay your water and electricity. You could pay through... With your crypto, with your non-custodial, you could pay for your uh, water and lights, whatever the case is. You upload the slip and you can make a payment and they handle that. So I think that's 
that is actually where I think a lot of crypto needs to be moving to is actually offering a lot of those real world use cases. You know, like um, that's how you actually get through to the next 1 billion users, you know, that, that level of growth that we need to see. Um, the current applications, or a lot of them, are very focused on crypto native people. But in order to really expand out to the next 1 billion users, or the way we term it in IV is called everyday DeFi. You're talking about everyday users that need to use some sort of DeFi use case. It could be lending and borrowing, a payment, uh, purchasing a good. Um, I think that's where we'll see a lot more creation or a lot more uh, product development happening in the next, now to the, into the next years or so, to actually get the everyday user, like my mom and dad, who will never use uh, crypto <laughs> in general, you know, like they'll never use lending and borrowing on MetaMask, but they understand how to use an application like a bank app. So I'm, I'm, the way I'm seeing, or the way we're seeing it uh, within IV is the Web2 companies that offer these services will start offering uh, crypto services as well. And you could then pay in crypto for various goods. We're seeing a lot of it, but I don't think there's enough of that adoption for, for the mainstream. Um, so I, I really like um, Krypton as a service. I think they offer something very, um, <laughs> very different. The, this Krypton, it, it works like a bridge between crypto and fiat world. Did I understand that correct? Yeah, it's, it's, they will handle or they handle the, the mechanism. So you don't need to, you could just use your crypto and make payment and they'll handle all the processing on, on their back end. Um, so they'll also handle the, the actual delivery. They engage with the, with the provider and they make the payments and they handle all that on, on their side. So just, so it takes, it basically allows you to do, instead of using your credit card or whatever we're doing now on top of like the likes of Amazon, um, that just now gives you the power through your non custodial crypto wallet to actually do or handle those payments. So that's quite uh, definitely one um, I highly recommend. In particular, I know it's maybe not here for, for this particular audience. We're more based out of Europe, but out of uh, uh, LATAM, that is actually getting quite a lot of adoption. Um, there is another one that I would really recommend, um, I mean, to hear the audience as well. It's called Money on Chain. Uh, and maybe Ricardo, you would have uh, heard of it, heard of them before. Um, I have not. Okay. Do tell so, me about it. Money on Chain is also more innovative in that sense. Um, I'm trying to just talk through the ones that I think would add a lot of value to, to the users or people listening in. Um, Please do. So the, the Money on Chain application is, is, is pretty cool. So it actually uses Bitcoin to receive passive income. So the, 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 the model itself can get quite technical. I don't want to get into too much into that, uh, into that level. Um, but they've got a token called BPRO like call it uh, the professional Bitcoin, if you want to call it that. And it's slightly leveraged around a one point, I think it's around one, 1.2 of a leverage on top of, um, on top of Bitcoin. So as uh, someone that holds that for the long term, it's more of a hodl kind of token. And you receive um, uh, passive income through any activity which happens on, uh, happens on top of the protocol. So BPRO users that are holding it, that's got a slight leverage, uh, also receive the... Um, uh, let's call it uh, fees that are generated with, with, within the protocol. So very aligned with Bitcoiners. It's been built by a couple of really, really strong Bitcoiners that have got, a, let's say, a long history in the, in the market. Uh, and for them, they wanted something that you could keep with Bitcoin, earn in Bitcoin, and you could hold for the long term. So as we're talking, like if you're a long-term hodler, this is exactly down the, your alley. It's slightly leveraged, so you're getting that potential upside because you're holding for that, that long term and you're also earning the, the fees that are generated on top of the, on top of the protocol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Money on chain. Sorry, Mal. That's, uh, that's correct. Exactly like that. Yes. Uh, the, the projects that Mike is talking us about are going to be on the, the zip is description. On the show notes. Yeah. yeah. And, and quite interesting. There was also built, um, I believe it was the first, I, I can definitely confirm that before. Um, maybe I need to confirm that first, but, uh, the the first bitcoin backed stable coin so your dollar it's a dollar stable coin but backed fully by bitcoin um so is it's, that it's a good idea <laughs> i think so i think it's one of the best collateral that you could so you can see the cat going crazy in the back <laughs> actually it's a good idea to do it now right or at least it's near so in terms of um, the stability of it, they've been going for three, four years, um, no issues with that. But if you look at the long term of what Bitcoin can do as collateral, um, short term, I think there's, uh, there's debates for it. But over the long term, what we've seen, whether it's bull or bear market, it's been a, an asset 
that has only grown in value over the long term. So uh, where fiat, on the other hand, has gone, I think we can agree on the other way. So it's again, it's for long term holders at the end of the day. That's that, that's the there's important um, let's say definition in terms of what c- certain people are going to be doing with with their capital. And that's why I'm saying for this instance, it's for the long term holders and what they. Uh, what they I mean. The question is always with with these kind of stable coins is uh, is is the backing enough backing? Uh, sure. So that's always the the main question, right? We never know. Uh, well, I'm I'm listening about it for the first time, and there's always that issue of what happens on a market downturn. Uh, exactly. Is the, is the stable coin going to keep its peg? I mean, hopefully. I is don't know. I've, question, I've not read it? the project. Is no, not the question he, he, more like uh, how low can Bitcoin go, right? Uh, yeah, that's always the question, condition. I guess. Yeah, for sure. Uh, to be honest, the the, the the technical details I can definitely share more with uh, with the Money on Chain team, and they can provide that that level of uh, information. Uh, but it has been going on as a service for for quite some years, and that's through up and down. So um, I, I would highly recommend to look into it. You know, do everyone as we know, do your own research, understand. Um, what the team and how they've gone about building it. Um, would love to have them on the show as well. I know they're not Portugal focused, but they're, they're just amazing, like what they're trying to achieve. In particular, like their vision of um, how fiat is just devaluating, like and how how they want to provide these kind of services, not just to the advanced us, you know, the people that are very f- familiar with crypto, but to the people that actually depend on something stable. Like if you look in Argentina, the inflation is now something close to 60%. These are the kind of services where, you know, there's huge amounts of value for something that may be volatile, but is it really losing value 60%? Like there's, 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 there's always that, let's say there's, um, uh, depending on the actual personas, uh, it will add uh, um, uh, value to, 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 to those individuals. So is, is the DOC uh, stable coin or the smart contract is it built on RSK? Is that it's built on top of RSK? Yeah, so their services okay. are fully built. So the um, uh, let's call it uh, B Pro um, service is a token on top of RSK. So that's been minted on 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 our smart contract platform. Um, you still need to get into RSK to, in order to use their services. Got it. What is the um, the relationship between Bitcoin maximalists and RSK? Yeah, I think there's a long history of um, <laughs> of Bitcoin maxis. Um, they definitely have a place and a role. Uh, overall, the vision is whether you're Bitcoin maximalist or you believe in Ethereum uh, or you believe in in anything else. Like the goal is to be building and continue building out um, as the services, whether you believe it's on a different chain or not. Uh, the Bitcoin maximalists definitely do have a, have a, have a have a have a role within within the community. Um, they're normally the strongest voices as well. Um, you can never appease everyone. I think that's, that goes without saying. It's, uh, it's nearly impossible to do so. But we are as aligned to Bitcoin as possible to still give it some sort of, and to still provide that, that level of flexibility. So depending on who you talk to, that may or may not be good enough. Our goal is to just continue bringing value, not just to Bitcoin, but to the people that are, are believing in, the, in the, the future of Bitcoin as well. So again, can't appease everyone. But I think overall, the... Uh, um, the acceptance has only improved over the past. Um, I think there's always a challenge. There's always a challenge at the beginning with any new technology or any anything that is is different. Um, but I've been at uh, Ivy Labs now for a year, and overall the and the conversations have only been you know what RSK is doing is it building on top of Bitcoin, enhancing what Bitcoin is, providing uh, more um, uh, utility and services, and also be given that symbiotic relationship helping Bitcoin in terms of security, uh, given the merge mining approach. So uh, it's, I know it's a long, a long way of answering, but I suppose there's no way you're going to ever appease absolutely everyone. The goal is to uh, continue pushing forward, to continue, continue getting as much uh, adoption as possible and um, taking it to, to the next level. Like Bitcoin, we all believe is going to be around, is going to be around to stay. We're seeing more adoption of Bitcoin um, regardless of what happens with the price, it's the adoption that's important and what's happening in the various countries and in the various companies. Um, I don't see Bitcoin being less and less adopted. I'm seeing more and more of it, whether it's now in Africa. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of conversations that are happening and that just leads well, not just only for RSK, 
but everything or all the other projects that are building around uh, around Bitcoin. Yeah, so the, regarding the maxis, as long as it's open, then anyone can join, and that's it. Who wants joins? They follow the rules of the protocol, and that's fine. You know, fully if they're maxis or not, well, you know, no one cares. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that everyone's entitled to the opinion, of course. Like you, you again, you'll never yeah, 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 please everyone. Course. It's it's yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. you're hundred percent right. Being open and transparent, I think, is the way forward. I think that's actually how Bitcoin was was more started, right? It's being open, transparent, understanding, uh, and that's what RSK is doing. Uh, I would say RSK is more of a, an intertwine between Bitcoin and Ethereum. So um, we try, we definitely. Um, in the position to tr uh, to be more open with with the various communities, I think that's the only way forward. Is that cross chain compatibility? That's where we're seeing the market moving to. Um, you don't see many projects just building on one particular chain. They're always trying to expand, and I think that is that's the future. Is this cross chain uh, um, uh, composability is going to be a very important theme for the future? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my, my question here regarding Maximal it's is much. It's more like because they don't like anything that it's not Bitcoin. And since RSK, it's kind of Bitcoin of, of Ethereum of, on top of Bitcoin. I was curious about it. Regarding RSK, it's a second layer, uh, but it's a uh, blockchain. It's going to be possible to have uh, things off-chain. When you say things off-chain? Uh, what, what kind, kind of um, like like Lightning Network. So the, those payment channels is that what you're referring exactly, to? Exactly, exactly. Okay, yeah. At at the moment, um, or maybe yeah. may, maybe I can make the question more generic. Uh, sure. Would uh, the existing layer two protocols of Ethereum be buildable on top of RSK? Ah, very. Very, very good point. So Much you're better. referring to the um, like the zk sinks of the world. You're talking yeah, about yeah, yeah, and all okay. of the protocols like Polygon and that kind of stuff. Hundred percent. So, in terms of where RSK <laughs> is, it, it's not at that um, at that phase where scalability is hundred percent required. In terms of let's say let's call it a layer three on top of on top of our layer two as a, as a side chain. <laughs> There's conversations whether it's a side chain, um, so layer one or a layer two. Uh, my view is it's a layer two on top of Bitcoin because that's uh, the term layer two is quite a generic term. Um, so RSK is a layer two sidechain. So well, there is a lot of conversations happening around scalability, even on top of RSK. So um, at the moment, we're in conversations or we've ported code from Matter Labs' ZK Sync, and we're working through that um, the, the implementation uh, of this ZK technology on top of RSK to actually bring that scalability to the next level. Um, so even though RSK is not at that point of requiring it, it's definitely being thought about for the future. And we've got the initial code that's been ported over. Um, that's actually being worked through testnet at the moment. Um, ZK Sync has not uh, released, let's say the mainnet version of smart contract capability. So uh, at the moment you can do transfers on the, on the, on the testnet. Um, but that code has been ported over on top of RSK to actually then scale out the network even further. So uh, definitely seeing that as a theme. Uh, and I think all chains will have a very similar approach um, uh, moving forward. So that's exciting and just in terms of that general um, scalability for, for Bitcoin, essentially. Because then it's yeah, because there I would, I would actually ask, since... Since RSK is already a side chain, uh, do those layer threes make sense? Because I mean, I guess it all, all, all always depends on um, how the RSK servers are being run. But I would say they'll they'll probably be very similar to what Ethereum is using. So I guess it would still make sense to have the. Uh, to have those um, layer threes, let's say? I think with any increase in activity, so as more and more building happens, we even seeing on the likes of Avalanche, at one point, uh, Avalanche was more expensive than Ethereum. You know, So um, that wasn't too long ago. That scalability, I think, is paramount as there's more and more uh, uh, activity happening. So the goal, or how we're seeing it as well, is rather plan for it now. <laughs> Rather think about the, the issue, not waiting for for things to become incredibly expensive or to become unscalable. I think at when you get to that point, especially being 
uh, not the first on the block. Like let's say Ethereum was the first in terms of smart contract capability. When you're the first on the block, of course, you're going to make mistakes. But you can't be third or fourth in terms of um, in terms of let's say EVM compatibility and not thinking about that for the future, because otherwise you're going to run into a problem and developers are just going to flee from that uh, from from that uh, particular chain or all that activity. Um, so definitely being very very thought out. RSK can be run. Uh, it doesn't require incredible hardware in order to um, uh, to run. So I'm not seeing that as uh, aligned with Ethereum. We're definitely a lot easier in terms of, of hardware capability. Um, but having said that, you still require that thinking for the future. If you want to get to a billion users or beyond, you have to be thinking about the next level of scalability. Um, and the layer threes, let's call them, are, or let's say, let's say on Ethereum, the uh, uh, layer twos bring that level of scalability, which is, I think, absolutely needed. Um, and I think all blockchains are thinking about that as well. If you look at Solana, it's going down the, and the same route. Like they're thinking about that next, that next, uh, the next step of, of scalability. Um, so even though we're not at that point yet of requiring it on top of okay. RSK, it's being thought about now. And we've really got code ported over to actually start scaling out RSK further. Yeah. Um, so basically the question was, uh, if RSK reaches the same scale as Ethereum, does it still need the, the layer threes that Ethereum is already using? I would say the winner would be the, the cheapest provider that is the most secure. So you'll always, you, you want to still be as cheap as possible, but as secure as possible. That's where I see RSK being more niche in its approach because it's relying on Bitcoin, you know, so it's, that's where the, the security, um, let's say the, the, the security component is coming from. So we have that. I think it's always good to be as cheap as possible and you'll just reach more users at the end of the day. You'll get more, uh, more activity. Um, and there's some use cases where, you know, 10 cents is too much. You know, you may want to be as low as possible. You can't be uh, competing in a lot of cases in the dollars, $10, $30 as what we're seeing, you know. Um, so as cheap as possible, that's the most secure. Those, I think, are the one or the chains that will then survive well beyond 10, 15, 20, 30 years. Um, and that's, that's the goal of what we're seeing on top of RSK. So that's the next layers will provide that additional level of scalability to, you know, become cheap, cheap as possible, essentially. Do you see, do you see, uh, sorry, moment, a quick one. Do you see um, a combination of solutions for people to use in the future between RSK, Ethereum, Avalanche, all, all the others? I mean, um, you, because you said, you said already that you, you think that the future will be multi-chain, right? Um, so how do you think that will work for the end user? Do you think between bridges, atomic swaps, how, do you, how easy do you think it will be? I think if um, maybe being optimistic, I think when a user wants to do something, like we'll click a button, wants to place a swap, the ideal world will be that it'll just find the cheapest route possible. You know, that would be the ideal world. So whether it be Avalanche, whether it be RSK, whether it be any other chain, um, I think that's being very optimistic. I know there's some projects that are trying to work on that. Like there's a, a um, layer zero that is, you know, building towards this um, building towards this approach of complete interoperability. Uh, but for me, it's more about what would be the cheapest way or the most, so both, both being cheapest for the user as well as the most secure. I, that's the way I would, I would see it moving forward. I think a lot of the chains have a future. I think uh, seeing, especially being at the likes of the Avalanche conferences as well, so many interesting things happening across, across all the chains. And we'll start seeing more niches, like a niche approach, like Avalanche may be more relying on the subnets, as an example, uh, where RSK is going to be more relying on the security on top of Bitcoin. I think that is a component or feature that RSK has where others, others cannot compete on that particular level. Um, but the goal is we're going to see a lot more adoption happening and the niche or our, the, the approaches of each chain um, will then start becoming a bit, more, um, a bit more visible. At the moment, there's a lot of money floating around everywhere. It's very murky in terms of the way forward, but I think the, the, the cream will rise at the end. You know, we'll see it in a few years where, uh, which chains are surviving and which don't and which need to pivot to, to something else. Um, and there's still more chains being created. I mean, I'm, I was shocked to hear that there's pipelines of like, there's already 160 blockchains or so. I think there's even more now. Um, there's a ridiculous amount of activity that's happening. I don't believe every one of them will exist, but the niche, Everyone will find their niche 
or, or most will find a niche and that's how it will then be um that's how the uh, value proposition of each chain will then be be taken forward. Yeah, I don't know if everyone like agrees. I, I, mean, I don't, I don't know if everyone you. agrees with me. On that. I mean, I, I think I agree, and I can, I can, I can, I can say that. I think the difference right now. I might be wrong, but just a personal opinion, of course. But the difference now, it seems, sure. between RSK and Ethereum, or you know, Ethereum and other uh, EVM competitors, is that you, you guys seem to be trying to build utility. When I say utility, it's about the usefulness of Bitcoin uh, as a payment player and then credit, etc. right? But you like the goal is not to build just coins and then on top of, of the on top of the coins some possible utility, right? You're trying to do it the other way around, it seems. Um, and I think that's quite valuable, honestly. And uh, I, I hope that's the right approach, honestly, because it's pretty cool. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, appreciate that. <laughs> I yeah. think that um, I think we'll see as, as we see more adoption of Bitcoin, again, all these side chains and layer twos will definitely um, be more and more valuable because it will scale, it will provide that level of, um, in particular for RSK, it will it'll provide a smart contract layer in order to then achieve these level of financial services. And uh, maybe a, as, a, as another comment, maybe even just DeFi in itself right now will evolve. And as we see more and more adoption from everyday people, like the everyday users, uh, more and more of these Web2 companies will need to build on, on chains, right? They'll need to start scaling out their services um, and that's where I think RSK is, in, is also well positioned. Is, is well positioned for that next that next level of growth. Do you guys have any more questions about RSK? Well, no. uh, I don't. a bit before you mentioned that you you thought that um, the next billion users will come from regular people, let's say. But how, how do you think we get to them? It's a good, it's a very very <laughs> good question, and I think a very difficult one to to try and answer. Um, so no, because I mean, I mean, I guess you guys on your side are trying to build the best products possible. So when the users come, 100%. things are ready and they can use it, right? But I always wonder what will make them come. Like, yes. do, you, do you think it's just, well, today I heard that maybe the Fed is thinking about starting to burn dollars, right? So maybe they figured the problem and there's only one solution, right? And maybe this is the, this is it. So let's say they do this and they kind of fix dollar and oh, crypto wow. gets less, you know, less of a use case maybe, right? And then mm -hmm. why why would people still want crypto or need crypto? Yeah, I I don't think that. Um, I mean, we all use fiat. I'm not going to just uh, bash on fiat because at the end of the day, we all need it. Like I think yeah, that's yeah. A, a fair. It's, I think it's not going away. It's, it's not, not going, going away. away. I don't think yeah. it's going to go away anytime soon because we definitely need it for for general base purposes, you know. Uh, but to answer the question around, you know, the how to get to those one billion users, um, we've coined a term in IV called everyday DeFi. So the term, very very broadly speaking, is positioning these DeFi services with everyday users for I think I mentioned like payments for uh, for swapping between currencies, you know. But what it actually more broadly means is that there'll be these web two providers that will that we as we know them so we'll easily be able to connect with them uh, we understand them there's a lot of wallets there's one that i'll also share here i highly recommend it's called lemon cash um, and that's more a custodial wallet so slightly different than what we are more used to with the non or self custodial side like the metamasks this is custodial so it's an entity behind behind the scenes I'm seeing the custodials as being absolutely vital for the next the next layer of, of that adoption because they typically bring that UI UX experience that we've been talking about, like you know making it easy for users, an application that you just download, you know you understand it, forget your password, don't worry, just email them, we can sort it out. Uh, that is people inherently need that level of service as well. You know we've got more crypto native, which is probably all of us. We could figure out MetaMask get it up and running. If we have an issue, we know that we lose our phrase. Sorry, funds are gone. Um, but for mass adoption, that level of service or that level of capability needs to change. And that's where I see custodials, in particular, the custodial wallets being playing more and more of a role. Highly recommend Lemon Cash. Um, they're based out of, out of Argentina, uh, around 1.1 million users. Uh, but there's a couple other services be, with, with that. But why I like them is their approach to um, onboarding general users into crypto. So mm -hmm. they abstract a lot of the, the noise. So 
what I mean by that is like you'll you've got your wallet, you've got your crypto in, like it could be Bitcoin, and you could you'll just hold Bitcoin. You don't know if it's a wrapped Bitcoin or or Bitcoin. They'll maintain it and they'll manage it. So they just show you Bitcoin, you know, ETH, and a couple of other assets. So if you now want to uh, lend out a particular a particular asset, let's call it USDT, you just click lend. They handle where that needs to go to. So there's pros and cons to this, but one of the biggest pros is that it extracts abstracts the users from a lot of the actual um, uh, a lot of the nice. um, yeah. complexity behind the scenes. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to figure all that out yourself. You don't have to understand it. You just know that it's being lent out. Um, again, there's pros and cons to it because we've seen recently what happened with uh, Luna and Terra uh, and UST. But if they're doing their due diligence as, as an entity, I think these are the kind of services where we actually loop, like leap that, 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 and that level of um, adoption. So they consider yeah, a Web2 yeah. company. I, I would consider them Web2 in terms of their, their capabilities. They've moved into crypto. So uh, I don't like particularly using Web2, Web3. The names are just so used and uh, I've, I'm using them more and more, which is overused. It's overused, unfortunately, and I'm going to use it no, now. And I, also, the lines are kind of blurry at this point, right? Like you have companies that have a foot on each side, let's yes. say, like you're saying now, right? So it can it, be Web3, but also kind of Web2 <laughs> at the same. Yeah. Just to I, I was going to ask, like, but yeah. at least on, on this case, and since they're an entity, if something like Terra Luna happened, then there are. I think liabilities that can be taken towards the, the the creators and the providers of the service, right? Yeah, I think abstracting it. I think that's the important bit. Is there's um, yeah, yeah, but I mean, if it goes wrong, right? 100%. This abstraction, as you were saying in the app, I think is is fundamental. That the more user friendly it is, the more people will use it. And I, and I think you're right that people don't really want to know where. It's money is going or whatever, right? They, yeah, yeah, so if, if I may just uh, basically reinforce what uh, Mike is saying, uh, I believe that uh, we will get there when people don't even realize they are using crypto. And that should be the end goal of, uh, of the, the apps that we are creating right now, in my opinion. That's what. That's Totally agree. Just by the way, uh, do you believe that uh, these apps like Lemon Cash can replace banks in the future? Bank like I, services, at least. I think there's a lot of them. Just just by just because of what what crypto can can provide, right? I mean, you can send funds across the globe almost instantaneously. I think there's there'll be a lot of uh, users adopting. Um, but I honestly also see the banks becoming more and more open to, to that adoption as well. So um, the ideal scenario is that everyone starts more, more of the adoption and understanding how to solve the UI, UX that I think that we actually crave in DeFi in general, you know, to actually abstract that away from a lot of users. Um, we saw, especially towards the latter end of 2021, um, I can't remember now who exactly bought it was a crypto company that bought out one of the older banks. I think one of the German banks. I'll uh, I just need to confirm. I'll, I can I can maybe also provide that that link. So that is one way of like crypto projects or companies buying out let's say the old institutions. Um, but there's also, in all fairness, a lot of capital, a lot of money sitting within the banks, um, and they've got the the actual power and capability to take their service and start becoming. I'm not going to say Web three, but Web two point five. And start building towards that uh, and there's been a lot of talks and a lot of conversations around some of the bigger banks going towards that route having so it, it was bitmax bitmax but a german bank that's it sorry yeah 100 percent. thanks that's uh, uh, exactly exactly that so um there's i think there's going to be multiple ways i'm very interested to see how the the industry evolves over the next course of a year or two because um i think there's going to be a lot of activity happening uh, whether there's a bull or bear market i think what's been proven uh, there's also a recent study around uh, the amount of Americans and the amount of uh, Europeans actively using crypto. It's, I think, a lot higher than most people were expecting. I think it was around that 10% mark, um, which if you're considering the amount of users that are actively doing crypto in some way, shape, or form, it's actually a fairly big number. Um, I'll also provide a couple of links uh, links to that. As in, I found an awesome, awesome post around what that actually means. for. It's still in the early adoption phase, but it's about to cross that uh, 
uh, chasm into the the next the next phase of that growth. I'll, I'll provide the links. Um, I'll provide the links here in 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 the chat um, as soon as I get them. Yeah, I I, I agree hundred percent. I mean, I think uh, again, I can't speak on behalf of everyone, but for myself, it was through centralized exchanges at the beginning that then got me into the likes of De or like let's call it DeFi in general. But for me, that was the the on and off ramp, right? That was for me to get into into DeFi. I needed some path or route. And for me, which made the most sense at that particular time is a centralized exchange. It's evolved from then to, to different kind of on and off ramp um, service providers. Um, but I think even these centralized exchanges, we've seen the sizes of likes of Binance and the kind of punching power that they have. It's enormous. Um, and they have also started to adopt crypto or DeFi, let's call it DeFi, um, behind the scenes as well. So you can lend and borrow and they actually plug into the DeFi services on the back end. So as we're talking about um, these kind of Web2 players, the exchange is actually doing very, very similar approaches as well. It's not pushing everything to, um, to DeFi. They are believers in it because they've actually integrated in, in the back end of their services. So um, yeah, you are 100% right. I think the large majority of that, I think it was 12% in the US, uh, is of course more, more centralized side. I think DeFi would be much smaller. Uh, and the, what needs to change is the, the UI UX would, uh, would have absolutely need to change to, in order to evolve to that um, uh, <laughs> mass adoption. I agree. Uh, Mom, I think Malman has Just another question for you, the last one, right, Malman? The typical, the usual one. Sure, sure. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I do. Uh, regarding RSK, I think we, we cover the uh, majority part of it. You have anything you want to, to add? Mike. No, I think um, I think all good. I mean, if there's anything that uh, anyone that's listening would like to know a little bit more, feel free to reach out to me. I can also share my um, uh, Telegram handle, uh, or and I can also share the um, Open Finance. That's our our link to all the partners that have built on top of RSK. I'm very happy to open up conversations. Um, I enjoy chatting to the to 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 various people, so I can share all those links as well. Um, Yep. Uh, they're going to be on the description of, of this episode. Uh, I have one question regarding RSK yet. Uh, I think everyone wants to know uh, when it's going to be the ECO. The ICO. ICO, yes. <laughs> yeah. There won't be there won't be any ICO. Oh, the, <laughs> top of RSK. I'm too late. I'm already too late to do the ICO. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the the real question, uh, Mike. When was your pizza day? First time you spent Bitcoin or any crypto in anything? That was, I think it was about two years ago actually when I started um, making purchases. Um, it, it was it was some time ago to be honest. Uh, sorry, this this cat. I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. You you, you um, buy a cat with with crypto. I can imagine, yeah. <laughs> Maybe in future everything, right? But uh, yeah, no. This this one is just getting. I think he's. I think he's angry. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, it's it's been a while. And yourself, when was the the first time you you, you made your first purchase, or first pizza a pizza day purchase? I I did buy a lent a lunch with uh, with my friend. With ten thousand yeah. bitcoins, or was it? A... Oh, oh, way way lesser. Uh, 30, 30 monero. It was yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I ever Mike. bought a pizza in that past. Sorry, I think it was, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, of course, no one knew it would have taken off to that extent, but geez, yeah, it's always, uh, it's a story I love. I, I think I'll tell everyone in the future. It's like, can you imagine just holding on to that, le that amount of Bitcoins? Yeah, crazy. Absolutely crazy. Mike, a little bit of a, I guess, a personal question. You've been in Portugal for how long now? Nine months, but on and off between Portugal and Spain. So more focused in Portimao. Okay. And uh, how, how was the process? I mean, I'm pretty sure you, you've seen the crypto community growing here in Portugal. Uh, yes. How has it been? In the Algarve in particular, there's been a lot more, um, a lot more activity than what I was thinking. I mean, really? if you look at Portimao as a, as a town compared to, let's say, Lagos or even mm -hmm. like Faro, it's very different in, in that sense. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations in the Algarve. There was uh, quite a lot of people building NFTs on Solana. Like I, th I thought that was that was yeah. quite interesting. Uh, um, I, I've seen a lot of those also. 
a, a lot, quite, there's you know, a fair amount of activity. Um, up in Lisbon, there's been just, a, I mean, there's so many people that are moving, maybe not in Lisbon in the center itself, but the surrounds. Um, it's really exciting what's happening in Portugal. I think it's only good for for what's happening, you know, for not, not, not only for Portugal itself, but as someone that believes in the future of where crypto is going, like I want to be networking with the people that are like-minded and see that and can challenge the different views. So um, in the Algarve, there's a lot of people that are, are based. Um, I, would, I wouldn't say fully based, um, but then do travel towards uh, into Portugal and stay for six, six months to a year, mainly focused on summer. I think a lot of them, a lot of them are more focused on that, but there's a lot of activity happening in Portugal. Um, you can see just the amount of activity just on the various um, uh, groups, uh, on the, the, the actual social groups. There's a lot and lot more people that are moving or a lot and lot more people that are interested in terms of what's happening in Portugal itself. If Lisbon, I think, going to be mind-blowing. Uh, that's end of year, I think, October. Yeah, you think it's going to be bigger than last year even? Yep, and then Solana Breakpoint, I think, will also be huge within Lisbon. I... I, I I can't see the Lisbon events being small this year. I just, I can't fathom going to ETH Lisbon or <laughs> Breakpoint and not seeing thousands of people. It, it just, I'd be, I'd be very disappointed if that's the case. MoneroCon is sold out. There's no more tickets. <laughs> For which one, sorry? <laughs> MoneroCon. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine things being sold out in a matter of like a couple of weeks, right? Um, so... Yeah, it's 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 that's the, that's how would I would see the activity happening in in Lisbon just to see the kind of things or let's say Portugal in general, but I think Lisbon is is where the focus is. Just see the, the and, and the level of things being sold out and the level of people of that are interested in it. That's for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. So if anyone here is attending, I mean, we're going to be at consensus uh, that's happening now in uh, Austin. So if anyone's uh, around. Please do let me know. I'm very happy to. We've got a booth. RSK has a booth at the consensus event. Um, I'll be at ETH Barcelona. So Kiko will will be seeing you soon. Um, <laughs> ETH Lisbon will be around. Oh, ETH CC as well. That's in Paris. Um, so please, if you're around at any of these events, please do reach out. Very happy to uh, to open up conversations and just uh, just chat. A lot of great events. Thank for you sure. for the conversation, Mike. It was very cool talking with you. You want Thanks. to leave uh, uh, contacts? If yes. anyone wants to reach you, I'll, uh, should I pop them here in the private chat or how does it? Yes, you can leave it in the private chat. It's on the episode notes also. Cool. I will pop all those details now and I'll just pop through this. Uh, these are just a couple of the links that are worth it. And I, I just want to find the, the, um, the blog post of, uh, of Sergio or his, his blog. Highly recommended for someone who wants to get more, more technical in nature. Um, highly recommended. Yeah, I believe I read that quite a long time ago. Amazing. <laughs> there's, there's, there has been a lot of updates since then, so you might want to <laughs> refresh. The, the, uh, the cat is called yeah. Gordo. Gordo. Oh, nice. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a very Gordo cat, so that's why he gets the name. <laughs> he wants to join us. I'm, I, I'm seeing that. Um, for Brokers, you can close it. So, yeah, I guess this was uh, the episode with Mike from Mars. Okay, thank you very much for listening and uh, smash the like button and see you next week. I appreciate <laughs> you, having Mike. me on. I appreciate the time. Thanks. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Mike. All the best. Thank you, Mike. Great talking to you. Bye bye. Bye bye. E não se esqueçam de nos seguir na vossa plataforma favorita, seja ela qualquer podcatcher, Spotify, YouTube ou Library. Entrem na nossa comunidade crescente no Telegram ou sigam-nos no Twitter em CryptoCafePT e partilhem este episódio com os vossos amigos. Até para a semana!